Made in Latin America. 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 Latin America. Welcome to Made in Latin America, a new podcast brought to you by the Santo Domingo Centre of Excellence for Latin American Research at the British Museum. In this podcast, you'll be listening to insights and interpretations about iconic collections at the British Museum, as well as examples from the more than 60,000 items, of which many have never been on display. Join us in this series that will deepen and challenge what you know about Latin America. This season explores the Tolintella Codex, one of the few surviving pre-Hispanic pictorial manuscripts made more than 500 years ago in the Mystic region in Mexico. In which language is it written? Why is its blue color so unique? What stories does it tell? The podcast will be hosted by two curators from the Latin America Center, Laura Osorio Sonax and Maria Mercedes Martinez Milanchi. Indigenous researchers, communities, and artists working with this codex will join us throughout the season. Hello, this is Mercedes and Laura from the Santo Domingo Center of Excellence for Latin American Research at the British Museum, and welcome to the Made in Latin America podcast. Today, we'll learn a bit about the Mixtex or New Savi, the people behind the Donindaya Codex, many of whom are leading research projects with the Codex. Just to remind you how it's going to work, me and Laura are going to have a conversation, and then we'll have some comments from different specialists, and throughout the episode, you'll be listening to a creative retelling of the Donindaya Codex, read by Miguel Villegas Ventura. Pain behind leads to pain ahead for Lord Eight Deer. He longs for clanking and clanging battle noise to drown out his jangly, mangling heart. First he walks, a long journey of aching feet with those items of power from Lady Nine Grass at the temple. Owl arrow, skull shield, gold fish, conch shell, blue ball, and that decorated dish for offerings. The fish and the conch lead him seaward till the royal wrapping Pacific fills his fierce view. The coast and a new home. A fresh start. Away from lost loves and old imagined futures. Here to build a new one. Look behind Lord Eight Deer and you'll see his half-brother. Loyal Lord Twelve Movement journeying with him still. An older steadier hand, lending strength as stone on stone they build a temple. Not the temple of death with its faithful pronouncement, but a temple of heaven, a replica from memory. And from memory each brick is her face, and each doorway shows her view, and each timber says her name in this new place without her. Last few episodes, we've been talking about the Toninde Codex, and we talked about how this codex is basically a history of genealogy of the Mixtec people or people of the rain. And so, this episode, we're going to focus on the Mixtec or the New Savi or the Nation of the Rain. And so, so yeah, Laura. So let's start with like the basic question: like, who are the Mixtec? Where do they live? And why are they called the people of the rain? Sure. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think I might have said this in another episode, but so Mishtek is not a name that was was given to the people themselves, i.e. they didn't call themselves the Mishteks. The Mishtek uh, is a central Mexican reference, uh, which means people of the clouds. Um, but they refer to themselves as Nual Savi, which means people of the rain. Uh, so the Mixtec people or New Savi live in parts of Oaxaca, Guerrero and Puebla, which is in central southern Mexico. And a lot of that area is, is highland, but there is also lowland. It's, it's very, it's very humid. There's a, there are, there are kind of cl- lots of sort of cloud cover. I think that's why they were called the people of the clouds. I imagine that one of the reasons that they're called the people of the rain or that they self-identify as the people of the rain is because because of the altitude that they live in on in this mountainous region but ultimately i think it's important to notice that it's a it's a, just it's a really big geographical area so it uh, it ranges from coastal to mountain to semi-arid savanna and a unifying factor of the mishtek people obviously is that a lot of them speak Mish- contemporary mishtek and, right. and the many variants even though it's not 
it's not necessary to speak contemporary Mishtek to identify as Indigenous, right? No, absolutely not. So, yeah, I think speaking a language ties you to a culture in a way that I don't think that many cultural knowledges do. And I th- so I think that speaking a variant of Mishtek is very much part of the region that is the Mishtek region. There are obviously lots of Mishtek people who no longer live in the Mishtek region and who may or may not speak the language. But there are also people who don't speak Mishtek in the region itself, right? I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a place that has lots of sort of larger towns as well as lots of very, very sort of rural places. So it's not either urban or rural, it's, it's both. And unfortunately, the Mishtek language isn't uh, standardised and taught in schools. So um, it's Spanish that's taught, people are taught to read and write Spanish, which, you know, is a surefire way of damaging the way that language acquisition works. Definitely. And, and a lot of Mishtag people um, nowadays don't, don't even live in, in Mexico anymore, right? They've immigrated to, to parts of the United States. That's right, yeah. So there's a lot of Mishtag people living in central Mexico, in Mexico City, or well in, in the state of Mexico, which surrounds Mexico City, and Mexico City itself. And there are lots of people living in the west of the United States, so Los Angeles and Fresno, which, I mean, and this is, you know, migration happens for, for a lot of different reasons. But obviously, I think in this case, it relates to economic factors a lot of the time. Yeah. So, so we know the, the Codex is written about the Mishtek, probably by Mishtek artists and scribes, even though we're not sure exactly who who's made it. Um, but what type of like visual and material culture do Mishtek people make today? The side of the codex that we've both been talking about and which the story in the podcast that, that threads through the podcast is actually set in the 12th century. Uh, Lord 8, Dear Jaguar Claw, was born in the 12th century. Uh, of course, it probably wasn't made in the 12th century. It was made probably quite a bit later. Um, but certainly it was made before the conquest of Mexico by Spain in the 16th century. In any case, uh, obviously, there has been an enormous interruption in the ancestral culture of Mixtec people since the conquest of Mexico, and and arguably since the the time in which the Mixtecs were um, absorbed to some extent into the Mexica or Aztec Empire. Of course, that's true of all cultures, right? There's no one pristine culture. There's no one continuous culture that never changes and never evolves on the basis of cultural contact, uh, etc., and colonization. And of course, colonization predates in many ways European co- contact in the Americas. But it's true to say that the kind of colonization that happens from the 16th century onwards in Mesoamerica, which is accompanied by a full-scale missionization project on the part of of the Spanish, as well as a complete and utter kind of reconceptualization to some extent of local identities, really did bring about an enormous shift in in cultural identity in, in the region. So it's easy enough to say that things like that things that happen to indigenous cultures like that mean that there is very little left of an an indigenous culture that can be compared to the kinds of things that we see in the Tanindaya Codex. But fundamentally, that's not true. And I think that to speak to a lot of people, and many of them have been going to be talking and giving quotes on this podcast, that they feel that there is a continuous link. uh, And that some of the disenfranchisement that they've suffered on the basis of colonisation can actually be to somewhat extent restituted through a re-engagement with important ancestral material like the Dying Day Codex. What is my commitment with my own people? When I was a child, I didn't know something about the codices. When I was in the elementary and high school, we didn't know about the codices. The pictorial manuscripts are ancient books made by my ancestors, the mystic people. Unfortunately, these kind of uh, books made in pre-colonial times after the conquest were destroyed and burned. No one is right now in the Mystic territory. They are mainly in institutions and museums in Europe and USA. And just two examples in Mexico City, but in Mexico City, in the National uh, Museum of Anthropology. That is the reason why uh, we don't know uh, nothing about the codices in the mystic territory itself. I am very sure that the knowledge of the codices is one of the things that 
I can support to spread information in the mystic territory for the mystic people. We start to developing the uh, digital projects has the uh, Codices Mixtecos app that you can find. And this is just enough uh, to start reading the Mystic Codices in the first level. But uh, right now I am working with the Codex Tony Indeye to link the, the knowledge and the content of these codices in uh, the present today. How looks, for example, the many of these uh, places where the Lord Adir was in the past and well, to show uh, how they are, where they are, and uh, how you can uh, see right now after five centuries of colonization. Omar Aguilar Sanchez is an indigenous Mixtec archaeologist who studies the history and cultural legacy of the people of New Sabi. He is particularly interested in Mixtec pictorial manuscripts and has been working on a research project with the British Museum for the past year. The app Omar mentioned is available on Google Play. If you're interested in downloading it, we'll leave the link on the episode's description. Um, so you, you talk about this, like, previous incursions or disruptions of, of cultural continuity due I guess, to, to warfare, due to land grabs, due to, to power struggles. And so do we see any of these power struggles in in the codex, in the, in the story of the codex? Not in the way that we would necessarily understand it from a European point of view, I don't think. But certainly the project of Lord 8 Deer Jaguar Claw is to unify the Mishtek region. You can actually see when you look at the codex one of the symbols that's quite recurrent. Uh, and I think if you, let's say you don't understand the codes that are written into the codex, you would but definitely see this symbol repeated and wonder what it was. And it's a toponym. That means a symbol that marks a specific place. And it looks like a hill or a mountain. Of course, the Mishtek region is very mountainous. Most of it is mountainous until you get to the coast. That hill will have certain designating features that demonstrate which town that is. Um, and then you see an arrow stuck into the hill. And what that means is that that's a place that was conquered through uh, a warfare or assault. Once temple built, an offering made, this man, the pot that boiled over, can go seek those sounds of cutting blades to drown in. The tensing smash of muscle on muscle, the dance before the deadly spirit, the half and throw of lives into air. A trained warrior and trained well and equipped it with sacred weapons. Lord eight deer find his sanctuary and conquest. And conquest once and again and again along these coastlines. Burning towns, taking prisoners, building an empire by atlato, arrow and axe. He spends years at this and returns home to the new Kno as a prince and emperor to be held by Kin, the conqueror of the oceans. But among the strings of victories, the celebrations, and the allies made, the line of subjugated lords gave to him precious feathers and gold and cacao groves. There are few smiles seen, few friends, no wife, no children for eight dear Jagger Claw. In a different land, not far away, the town of Ship a Bundle, a path both different and the same. Pain behind leads to pain ahead for Lady Six Monkey. A wedding and childbirth with new claim husband. Not the man she expected, but the man that she has. Few smiles seen on her wedding bed, few friends, but a husband and five children, two hers and three from the women before she was here. Two paths, two hearts, both different and the same. And so what towns that are mentioned in the Codex are mentioned, like I guess through through toponyms, um, like you talked about earlier, that, that still exist today or still have the same name as in the Codex? So um, I'm definitely going to choose the, I think, the most important place, in a sense. Well, you could say the most important place is Tilantongo, which is where Lord A. De Jaguar Claw is from and born. Uh, but no, at some point, um, and it's a very pivotal part of the narrative, uh, and I've mentioned it a few times, uh, Lord A. De Jaguar Claw 
and Lady Six Monkey go to what is called the Waikai, which is the domain of Lady Nine Grass. And it's this fearsome place. It's this place which is associated with death and ancestors and bats and owls and etc. Um, and it was probably in a cave. And it is in a town which is now called Chalcatongo. And that, apparently the place that in the Codex is referred to as Waikai in the contemporary Mishtek is called the Veyakin. And it's still a place that is, connotes uh, some fear and some idea of dark forces. Interesting. And so so there's these places that are referenced in the Codex from the 12th century that, that we can identify today. And what are the other, I guess, cultures or civilizations that are, I guess, conquered by Lord Eight Deer Jaguar Claw or mentioned throughout the Codex? As I said, Lord Eight Deer Jaguar Claw does do a, a big campaign across what is now, we now call the Mishtek region. Um, but there is a part of the Codex when he actually goes on a much longer journey. And in this case, it's not a journey for conquest, it's a journey for alliance. Um, and he goes to visit the Toltec king. And it's this Toltec king who ultimately, I think, reinforces his status as a sort of important ruler. They also travel to Laguna de Terminos, which is the sort of swampy region on the Gulf Coast. Archaeologists talk about a an Olmec civilization, which is pre-classic, and they talk about a Maya civilization, which existed at, let's say, 200 CE as a pre-classic, but then has an apogee much later. Uh, and then there's a Mexica civilization, which is the civilization that confronts Hernán Cortés and the conquistadores. But uh, clearly, I think if if the continuity between Mishtek people now and the Mishtek people that are described in the Codex says anything, it says that there is no beginning and end of civilizations. Mesoamerica was settled by different indigenous cultures, many of which had lots of things in common. That's in terms of culture and, and religions. And obviously, like all cultures close by to each other, there's a lot of borrowing in terms of aesthetic style. Uh, material culture, etc., and and that's and that's something that I don't think you can necessarily speak of the dying out necessarily of different of people um, and people's culture. But you, I suppose you can talk as if you as an archaeologist, you can talk about of the dying out of certain material culture styles and certain architectural styles. So yeah, I suppose what I would say is that there is a kind of reality of of Mishtek twelfth century life that archaeologists and, and pictorial manuscript experts have tried to unpack on the basis of all these books. Um, and we can recognise their gods, we can recognise Lady Nine Grass, for example. But at the same time, there are lots of those ideas still are still relevant to contemporary Mishtek people, even though I think for people now in Oaxaca, Guerrero, Puebla, realistically, their majority self-identified as Catholic. So you're talking about how archaeologists define cultures, pre, pre-conquest pre cultures, but I think indigenous archaeologists today are doing really interesting work, integrating contemporary languages, integrating their their own cultural experiences and cultural knowledge to to decipher the codex, to understand with more nuance, I think, than, than before, what type of language is being used in the codex and, and what's the meaning. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think that's the interesting question, in a sense, about these kinds of investigative contributions. A lot of people look at it and they say, OK, hang on a minute, are, you, are, are Indigenous archaeologists relating something which is very, very historical to contemporary culture for a set, like strategic reasons? Are they saying that this, this continuity exists um, to insist on their cultural difference in the context of Mexico, whose public policies, you might say, have damaged indigenous identity. And if that's the case, how can you argue that there's any scientific benefit for doing so? Because this is just a political assertion. Or are you saying, which a lot of indigenous archaeologists say, hang on a minute, it's all very well for our culture to be appropriated and interpreted by non-indigenous people. But you're not going to get it right because you don't speak contemporary Mishtek, for example, so you're going to have a harder time understanding what's in this codex. You don't know, um, you know, the utensils that we used to cook with. You don't know what is it, what it is we grow 
and how we grow and cultivate foods and, and are in, in no way necessarily knowledgeable about our religious perspectives and philosophical perspectives. So how can you think that you are in the best position to interpret uh, these manuscripts? And I think that the hard thing for people is somehow to try to marry those two different perspectives together because I think they are part of the same thing. There is, there is a very deep scientific importance for indigenous participation in these kinds of interpretation. And there's also an, a very uh, significant political importance for that too. I am Armando Bautista Garcia. I am from Apasco, a mystic community that belongs to the district of Nochisclan in Mexico. I am a film producer and writer. My films cover a variety of themes, but most are inspired by or taken from my personal experience. I left my community when I was 10 years old and arrived in Mexico City speaking only in the mystic language. That marked me deeply in such a way that there is always an element of family migration of or fragmentation in my cinematography. Such is the case in the film Alma y Esperanza, which addresses the first encounter between a girl and her mystic grandmother when she travels from the United States to an indigenous community in Mexico. Another example is Tiempo de Lluvia, a film about a boy who moves from his mystic community to join his mother in Mexico City, leaving behind his grandmother who had raised him until the age of seven. I am constantly looking to relate the dynamics of life in my community through fiction and documentary. The elements that stand out the most in my work are the presence of a cast made up mainly of mystic people, to stress the fact that indigenous people should represent themselves instead of being represented by others. Furthermore, the presence of the mystic language is fundamental as it is a living language. I believe this is necessary to conserve and preserve this language through an audiovisual medium that allows for the use of local dialogues and story management. Making movies is for me a way of giving meaning to my own experience through the stories and conflicts that occur in each film. Cinema is a medium that allows me to explore different worlds and therefore I always try to communicate this experience both a local audience and to an audience made up of people from other cultures. As Armando mentioned, El Último Consejo has won three awards in 2012 and 2013 at the International Film Festival Viña del Mar, the Film Festival Rodando Films, and the Festival Imagine Native. As many other people commenting on this podcast season, Armando participated in the event Ancient Writing Contemporary Voices and wrote a script inspired by the Toninella Codex. This was acted out by Yalitza Paricio and Angeles Cruz. You can find the recordings from the event on our website, sdcellarbritishmuseum.org. That's S D C E L A R BritishMuseum.org. What are some of the like contemporary practices that continue today that we can identify? in the Codex, for example? There are lots of them, but uh, one which I remember, my PhD supervisor, Martin Janssen, is a Codex specialist, and he's married to a woman from the Mishtek region. Her name is Gabina Aurora Perez Jimenez. They've been working for decades trying to decipher the codices, including the, the Zuzhnatl or Donindea Codex. Aurora came to the British Museum a couple of years ago to see the Donindea Codex, and so she was reading it for us. And there is a part, um, and it's a very sort of, Again, it's a very dramatic part of the narrative where someone is harmed, I won't give the story away, um, in what's called a temascal, a steam bath. Uh, and this is a kind of dome-shaped structure with a sort of oven in it. And basically, you get in it and sweat <laughs> a lot. Um, but it's it's generally used in some cases for ritual ceremonies, variably. Uh, but it's very commonly used for women also after childbirth as a sort of way to... Uh, repair some of the physical trauma that happens after after childbirth. And as such, it's a place that's very much associated, I think, with sort of female solidarity. And Aurora was looking at the picture of the Temascal and she said, yeah, that's that's what it's like for us when we go to the Temascal. You can hear the chatter of people and laughter. And so 
it's all yeah it's obviously a place that's very important for people in the in the Mishtek region particularly women and I think that that's something that's sort of cherished also as a as a sort of part of ancestral living definitely and, and I, I remember when Aurora was at the museum and and she was explaining that scene and it was really um it was it was really interesting to to see uh I guess it's considered by the museum an archaeological object or a a pre-conquest object meaning so much to somebody today and and how you can identify like practices today in something from from the 12th century which I don't I don't know if if happens in that many other places of of the world no so yes it's true I mean I mean it's it's always my point of view that for some for some reason very ancient things do mean things do mean a lot to people in the present don't they and that's why in a way that's why museums can be such a evocative emotional spaces what it means to people doesn't have to be centered on ancestral knowledge or any kind of knowledge at all um, sometimes it, it really is just a response to materiality or to the very idea of something being ancient and past obviously in the case of Gavina Aurora it's it's both it's but it's it's both something which is important to her culturally and it's also something that she spent decades researching right so so she understands in its depth and understands a lot of the continuity involved in involved in in in, in the relationship between the codex and contemporary communities in our next episode we're going to explore a fascinating and mysterious complex pigment which is used in the codex a bright blue known as maya blue so it's a color that's been of particular interest for archaeologists because of its resilience to chemical attacks over time thank you for listening to made in latin america the epic of Lord A. Deer was read aloud by Miguel Villegas Ventura. This creative reinterpretation, scripted by Jack Monaghan, is based on the Tonintelle and other Mishtek codices that mention Lord A. Deer's story. We are particularly indebted to the book, Encounter with the Plum Serpent, Drama and Power in the Heart of Mesoamerica, by Martin Jensen and Gavina Aurora Perez Jimenez and the play Recreation of the History Told in the Mishte Codices by the community theater Yoño Sabi, directed by Maria Ofelia Porras Lescas. This podcast season is made possible by the generosity of Alejandro and Charlotte Santo Domingo and Mrs. Julio Mario Santo Domingo with Andres and Lauren Santo Domingo. If you want to know more about the Santo Domingo Center, please visit SD Cellar website, sdcellarbritishmuseum.org. This podcast was recorded, engineered, and edited by Prong Productions. For more information on Prong, please visit prongproductions.com. That's P-R-O-N-K productions.com. 